as you make your way to your seats. If you would grab your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra, particularly Ezra chapter 5, and you will find Ezra nestled right between 2 Chronicles and the book of Nehemiah. Ezra chapter 5. If you're using one of the Bibles in the seats in front of you, which you're welcome to do, the black hardback, it's on page 392. Page 392, Ezra chapter 5. We're moving our way through this book of lists and letters and finding it as the Word of God abundantly profitable and relevant to us. We are in the fifth chapter of the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter 5, we'll look at the entire chapter this morning. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Ezra chapter 5, verse 1, it is written, Now the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Ado, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. At the same time, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shethar Bozani and their associates came to them and spoke to them thus, Who gave you a decree to build this house and to finish this structure? They also asked them this, What are the names of the men who are building this building? But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until the report should reach Darius, and then an answer be returned by letter concerning it. This is a copy of the letter that Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shethar Bozani and his associates, the governors who were in the province beyond the river, sent to Darius the king. They sent him a report in which was written as follows. To Darius the king, all peace. Be it known to the king that we went to the province of Judah to the house of the great God. It is being built with huge stones and timber is laid in the walls. This work goes on diligently and prospers in their hands. Then we asked those elders and spoke to them thus. Who gave you a decree to build this house and to finish this structure? We also asked them for their names, for your information, that we might write down the names of their leaders. And this was their reply to us. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the house that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and finished. But because our fathers had angered the God of heaven, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried away the people to Babylonia. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, Cyrus the king made a decree that this house of God should be rebuilt. And the gold and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple that was in Jerusalem and brought into the temple of Babylon, these Cyrus the king took out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered to one whose name was Sheshbazar, whom he had made governor. And he said to him, Take these vessels, go and put them in the temple that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be rebuilt on its site. Then this Sheshbazar came and laid the foundations of the house of God that is in Jerusalem, and from that time until now it has been in building, and it is not yet finished. Therefore, if it seems good to the king, let search be made in the royal archives there in Babylon to see whether a decree was issued by Cyrus the king for the rebuilding of this house of God in Jerusalem, And let the king send us his pleasure in this matter. This is the word of God. Let's go to him together in prayer. Our Father, those who wait on you, you promise, have their strength renewed. They will soar like the wings of eagles. They will walk and not grow weary. They will run and not grow faint. You supply all that your people need as they trust you and look to you in obedience and faith. Our Father, we need patience and faith and waiting upon you even this morning as we are under the hearing of your word and its preaching to us. We need to hold fast to your word that it might bear fruit with patience in our lives. Father, help us as we hear your word here in Ezra to hold it fast. And may your word find good soil in our hearts 
that it would profit and prosper and we would be fruit bearing by your spirit and for the glory of your son Jesus. We pray you would help the one who expounds your word that you might use and take him up to profit and build us up in your truth that we may continue the work you've given us to proclaim your gospel and to serve you until your son returns for us. We love you, we praise you, we come to you in his name in whom we eagerly await, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. By the 1500s, Roman Catholicism dominated Europe so that Europe was just simply called Christendom. To be a Christian at that point in history in the West was simply to have just been born in Europe. But about the 1500s, teachers began to receive greater understanding of God's Word and grow in their study of it. One of those was a German monk and theologian by the name of Martin Luther. And in 1517, which is 500 years ago next year, he nailed 95 theses to a church door in Wittenberg where he taught. He did so to begin a debate over what is true Christianity. And he wrote 95 sentences, statements, that he thought needed to be discussed and debated. I think my favorite is his first. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he meant that the entire life of the Christian was to be one of repentance. And what Luther was discovering by that in God's word, what he was recovering, is what we call now the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. That Christians are those who continue and live by faith in Christ. They continue trusting Him. And that you cannot identify then a Christian by a religious ceremony. You can't identify a Christian by a single decision or a single prayer. And you can't even identify a Christian by what someone will affirm when it costs them nothing or there's nothing invested. You identify Christians by how they live when things are hard. Who they trust when it's costly and sacrificial. And what we're looking at in God's Word in Ezra 5 at this point in his dealings with his people Israel is exactly just that. Things getting hard. Very hard for the exiles here that have returned to the land of Israel. At this point we are at here in Ezra 5, all the excitement of returning to the land and having laid the foundation of the temple as we saw in chapter 3, that's all over. It's been long gone actually for decades at this point. If you remember back in chapter 4 verses 4 and 5, the people are being continually discouraged from continuing the efforts of building by the peoples of the land who will become the Samaritans, the peoples of other nations that had been resettled there as well. And so at the last verse, at the end of chapter 4, we see in verse 24 of chapter 4, the work on the house of God had stopped. It had ceased until the second year of Darius, the king of Persia. That's almost 20 years where work had stopped because of discouragement. Now they stopped working Not because God said, take a break. Not because God said it was too hard. They stopped working because they thought it was too hard. Things were hard. Obeying God at this point certainly was not easy at all. And the way to success for them was not immediately apparent. And so they just quit and they stopped. Now as I mentioned last week, this whole section, Ezra chapter 4 through Ezra chapter 6, is all about the rebuilding of the temple. And we could easily skip ahead to chapter 6 and see the temple will be rebuilt. Particularly in verse 14, we see the temple is built and restored. But we best not skip ahead in what is between chapter 4 and chapter 5 here in Ezra decades. These are decades here of lingering. We need to linger here, I think, with Israel in the tension of stopping when God did not say stop of ceasing when they had no reason to. In many ways, where we are here in Ezra chapter 5 is the point where we are going to discover then who really is God's people. Who are they really? Because trusting and following God now is, is not easy at all. They face the question at this point in their history, the question of persevering, of continuing. And they face the question really that is at the heart of perseverance, the limits of their patience. The limits of their patience. Patience is an overlooked grace. We don't have a lot of patience for patience. It's easily ignored. We are, I am, and you are impatient people by nature. And our patience is continually discipled by our culture and world around us. We have deadlines, urgencies, 
We get same-day deliveries for things we order online, and we expect that's the way your life is. You click a button, and it just it drops at your door mysteriously. That little prepares you to have a heart of patience. But patience is the fruit of God's Spirit, we are told in the Bible. And patience even identifies those who actually belong to God. It is a fruit of God's work in our life. That's what the Lord Jesus himself said when he told the parable of the four soils, and he ended it by telling his disciples that those who are his disciples, those who follow him, are those who hold fast to his word and bear fruits with patience. And when the Apostle Paul had to defend himself and his credibility as a sincere apostle, what did he point to in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? He said, we commend ourselves in every way by great patience. It's his patience that testified to his sincerity as apostle. A life of repentance, a life of persevering in the faith, enduring to the end, continuing to trust God, for this one needs patience. Patience in hard situations. Patience with difficult people. Patience in sorrow. Patience in crisis. Patience with God's timing. I suggest that we might want to actually rephrase the doctrine. Instead of the perseverance of the saints, we may actually want to call it the patience of the saints. God's people are the patient ones. Because patience is what was needed by the people of God here in the book of Ezra. It is what's needed by the people of God today. And what we have here in this chapter, though the word patience never comes up explicitly, it is all over this page here. And the Holy Spirit is teaching His church that our worship and work for God will only last and only continue by patience. And what I want to do with you is observe four acts of patience in this chapter. There are four fruits, we might say, or four evidences of patience. In verse 1, we see patience in the turning from selfishness. In verses 1 and 2, we see patience in their submission to the Word of God. In verses 3 through 5, we'll see their patience in waiting on God. And then as we look at the letter in verses 6 through the end of the chapter, we'll see their patience in walking with God before men. Four evidences, at least here, of patience in the life of God's people. Well, let's start first with verse 1 and see the first act of patience in turning from selfishness. Turning from their selfishness. We've already seen in chapter 4 last week that opposition from the people of the land was a given. It was normal. In fact, it was going to continue throughout their history, even as Ezra gave us a flash forward in the middle of the chapter to see that for 80 years, it was just going to be ongoing opposition from the people of the land. And that is not, though, what stopped the building of the temple. It certainly made it hard, but that's not what stopped it. And we got a hint, if you remember, back in chapter 3, that there were more things at work than just the external opposition. You remember at the end of chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, the old men who had seen the first temple, when this new work began, and all of God's people were shouting with praise, they were crying. They were crying wrongly, because they had wrong expectations of what God would do. They were, we might say, impatient with the progress they'd already made. Impatient with what God was doing. And that was our first sign that trouble is coming. And we see that also here. If you look at verse 1, we see that God sent His prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. And their ministry was addressing what was wrong within the people of God. I want to turn with you just to one of these prophets to get a sense of their ministry. So let's go to the book of Haggai. Turn with me to the prophet Haggai. It's the third book from the end of your Old Testament. So if you want to go to the very end or the Gospel of Matthew and you go Malachi, Zechariah, and you find yourself in Haggai, you may also find Haggai in that portion of your Bible where all the pages are stuck together, otherwise known as the Minor Prophets. The book of Haggai, chapter 1. And as we drop into just the beginning of the book, chapter 1, verse 1, we see we are at the exact same point in history as we are in Ezra 5. Notice, he came in the second year of Darius the king which is until when the building had stopped, is where we were in chapter 5. And notice how Haggai reports in verse 2 what the people are saying. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now, with time there, they're not talking about a point in the calendar they have scheduled. It's just not come up yet. No, by time here, they're talking about, we might say, season, or condition, or the right opportunities. 
In other words, verse 2 is essentially means it's just too hard to be building this right now. It's not the right time. It's not the right conditions. But notice with me verse 4, Haggai's response to this statement. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paddle houses while this house, being the temple, lies in ruins? Now, paneled there refers to cedar paneling at this time. Cedar paneling that you would use to adorn great houses like the temple. It adorned the first temple that Solomon had built. And if you remember back with me in one of those little lists that we looked at in the book of Ezra, chapter 3, they had already brought cedars down from Lebanon to Joppa and had those resources ready so that they could panel the temple. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled houses? They had cedar to panel the temple. Do you see where this is going? They took the resources that had been apportioned and that had God had given them to rebuild the temple. They decided it wasn't time to do that. It was too hard. But you know what? It's a great time. We got the cedar just sitting here. Why don't we put it on our homes? It was too difficult to build God's house. It was not too difficult to build theirs. And so as we go on here in Haggai 1 and verses 5 and 6, they suffered God's just discipline. Verse 6, you have sown much and harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. What Haggai is recalling here are really the curses that God promised his people if they were unfaithful in his land. The things we could go back and look at the book of Deuteronomy in chapters 28 and 29 where God is talking about what will happen to God's people if they reject him in the land. The things that were to be warning signs for them, clanging bells and red lights and red flags that they are out of fellowship with God. They are not trusting him. They are not faithful with him. And so he calls them in verse 5, consider your ways, look at your life, you're under my discipline. Don't you see that what you're doing is not faithful? And so he calls them then again in verses 7 and 8, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. And note this, that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. And that was the issue. The issue was the glory of God was not in the place in their hearts where it ought to have been. They were selfish. They were looking to themselves, not living for the God who brought them to himself and brought them back to the land. So God is calling them to repentance and to bear fruit of repentance. Regardless of the hostility you face, you get up those hills and you chop down some new wood. And you bring, come back down and you build this temple. And their real problem, God summarizes in verse 9, you looked for much and behold it came to little. You looked for yourself And I blew it away, verse 9. Why? Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. The situation wasn't impossible. It was just hard. But they didn't want hard. They didn't want to trust the God who had already proven his faithfulness in spades and all he had done in bringing them back to the land. They were more afraid of discomfort than they feared God. That was their greater concern, was themselves. And we just glance as we go on in the book of Haggai. There is good news here in verse 12, as we've already seen as we've read chapter 5. Zerubbabel and Joshua, they obeyed the voice of God. And at the end of verse 12, they feared the Lord. And then notice the promises they start getting, not just rebukes, but God's promises. Verse 13, I am with you, declares the Lord. I know it's hard, but you've forgotten who's with you. It's me. I am with you. And then as you glance ahead into chapter 2, notice verse 9, the great promise they get. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. That what they're doing may bring tears to the elderly among them, but it's part of God's great global plan. This temple they're working on is contributing to the greater work And even the temple of God Himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, will come into this temple and real peace will be accomplished in Him. And so He's giving them these foretaste of gospel promises. You don't know what you're contributing to. Trust Me. And He gives them those promises to encourage them, to help them. But first, God's people had to turn from themselves. They had to repent. 
They had to repent of their fear of man. They had to repent of their fear of being, being unimportant. They had to repent of their faithlessness and God's ability. They had to repent of their greater concern for comfort than that God, Haggai 1 verse 8, would be pleased and glorified. Now turn back with me as we've gotten a flavor of the ministry of the prophet Haggai back to Ezra chapter 5. And as we come back to this chapter, we now have then greater perspective at what was going on in the hearts of God's people. And even we know now that the temple ceased because of their selfish desire that they would be honored in their own comfort rather than God be glorified. God's people had been waiting nearly 20 years, but it wasn't patience. It wasn't patience at all. It was actually impatience. They were impatient with the discomfort and difficulty of trusting God. They were impatient of having to walk before God and not know how He would provide, not know how He would protect, not know how He would lead them in His providence. They were impatient with having to suffer opposition for their obedience to God. During the Reformation, Martin Luther faced the armies of Europe and the power of the Pope. But this is what he said his greatest fear was. I am more afraid of Pope self than of the Pope in Rome and all his cardinals. Isn't that true? Is not our biggest hindrance to our own perseverance, our own patience, well, it's us. It's us, not our circumstances. It's, it's our pride. And it's the fear that our pride is fueling, that the consequences of obedience, that they'll be too much, that, that God won't help me enough, that my particular generosity, my sacrifice for the glory of God, maybe in the end I'll think it wasn't worth it, that trusting God was, was a fool's errand. And we can even use that kind of self-focus to excuse investing in our own comfort and convenience as the people of Israel. Now can't be the time to serve God. I mean, I mean it's, just, it's just hard. I mean, God can't be sending missionaries there. I mean, people, you know the life expectancy there? No way. We're Americans. It's too hard. God wouldn't ask me to actually, like, trust Him, would He? I wouldn't actually have to, to wait on God. I'll wait, I'll wait until it's easy to trust God. That's a good question for us to ask ourselves at times. What are you waiting for and why? Are you waiting until it's, until it's easy to deal with your sin? Are you, are you waiting perhaps until it's easy to share the gospel when you don't risk being insulted or, or opposed? Or maybe you're waiting until it's easy to serve the church or to serve Christians until you can find something that's completely satisfying and rightly uses and recognizes all your wonderful gifts. We can wait for these things. But beloved, if we wait until it's convenient and comfortable to trust and obey God, we will wait for the rest of our lives until one day we will realize, maybe too late, that our life was wasted wasted on ourselves. Jesus told us to deny ourselves daily. And what he meant by that is daily, it's going to be hard to trust him and there's going to be many great promises we are going to have to hold on to by his grace. The day when following Christ does not require self-denial, sacrifice, and hardship is never coming. It will never be here, ever, where it is easy to follow Christ and trust God. So today, God is calling His people to turn from selfishness and to trust Him, to work and to serve and to pray and to preach, to put on patience and to trust Christ today. That is the first act of patience we see is the call to turn from selfishness. And secondly, we see them in verses 1 and 2 of Ezra 5, submitting to the Word of God. And we see the Word of God bearing profit here, immediately in their lives. Nothing changed in their circumstances. It's important to note that. The people of the land did not all of a sudden become friendly. The government did not all of a sudden become inclined to their project. The only thing that had changed was to whom they were listening. 
They were no longer listening to themselves. They were no longer listening to the counsel of their fears. They were listening to the Word of God. God lovingly sent His prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, with some hard words to be sure, but also some great promises. And they came in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. End of verse 1. Now politically, the people of God are are really exiles in a province of the Persian Empire. Socially, they're outcasts in a, in a hostile culture, belittled and maligned. But that, none of those things is their final identification. Their final identification is being under God. God was over them. Their only master and Lord, their only provider and protector, was not the king of Persia, and it wasn't the people of the lands. It was God. God was over them. And if God is over them, then they were accountable. And if God is over them, then they can have assurance that He is with them. God was over His people, and they knew that by the ministry of His Word, as God sent His prophets who prophesied and reminded them of the God over them. And that is always how God works. It is by the ministry of God's Word is how God brings and reminds us of His presence. That is how God has come to us. That is how the world began. God spoke. And God sent His prophets as He did here in the Old Testament and spoke. And then when God's Son became a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what the Bible says? It says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the only God whom no one had ever seen was made known. He was explained by Jesus Christ. Christ is God's full and final word to us. His revelation. He's explained God to us. And the Lord Jesus has explained to us our accountability to the God over us as sinners. That we are under a holy God. And what we see in the Lord Jesus Christ, a perfect life laid down on the cross for sinners bearing the wrath of His Father, there we have a real accounting and reckoning of who we are and our accountability. That to pay the penalty we owe as sinners to God, it required the death of His Son. In Christ, God explained our accountability to Him as sinners. And in Christ, God explained our hope to be with Him and have Him with us as our God. Because on that cross, Jesus did suffer God's wrath for sinners. And he rose again on the third day after being buried to ascend to the right hand of God on high that all who call upon his name and trust the Lord Jesus Christ are assured. They're forgiven. Their penalties paid. They know God. God is with them because he has made peace with them. This is why Christ assured us that he will always be with to the end of the age his disciples. But before he did that, what did he say? That everyone be taught to observe what he commanded. Because that is how we know he's with us. By his word. Christ sends his word with his spirit. And friend, if you are here this morning and you are not a Christian, let me encourage you now, by his word, God is calling you to know. To know that he is over you. You're accountable to him that you will have to again give account for your, your sin, your rebellion, your rejection of Him. And only by trusting His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, may your sins be forgiven. May you have peace with your Creator. And even more, walk in that peace for the rest of your life into all eternity. Don't wait for a sign that's not coming. Don't wait for an impulse you don't need. God has given His Word. That is how He comes. That is how He assures us that He is over us and we are accountable to Him by His Word. And we see here even more in verses 1 and 2 that God changes people as they submit to His Word. Notice the sequence of events here in verses 1 and verse 2. You see Haggai and Zechariah prophesying. And then notice what happens in verse 2. Zerubbabel and Jeshua, they arise. And they begin to rebuild. They get to work. The prophets aren't interested in simply informing their minds. He's reforming their lives. 
They're calling them to action on the basis of God's Word, confronting their sin, calling for obedience, giving them the promises of God to encourage them. And notice that, the end of verse 2, that was continually necessary. The prophets of God were with them, supporting them. The whole time, in their fears, in their insecurities, the Word of God was there, encouraging them, being their strength and encouragement. We ought not think that Haggai and Zechariah just dropped in and they they preached a couple bang-up sermons and it was done. It doesn't work that way, let me tell you. I do it for a living. It doesn't work that way. They're continually alongside them, reminding them again and again, consider your ways. Remember, you're concerned about the pleasure of God and His glory, not your comfort. Remember, He is with you. Remember, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. All these things are reminding them, encouraging them, supporting them. And if we take the sequence of events into chapter 6, when this temple will finally be done, this is four years. Four years of encouragement with the Word of God. Patiently calling them to submit and learn of God. To trust Him. To believe His Word. And to act accordingly. As we know now in history, eventually Martin Luther triumphed. And when Martin Luther explained how he had won such favor and how he had gotten so much agreement in Germany, he gave this answer. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's Word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends, the Word weakened the Pope. I did nothing. The Word did everything. The Word of God does everything. It is God's Word that fights back our fears. It is the Word of God that fights against our flesh to build up our trust and faith in God, to work for His glory, to seek His pleasure, to serve Him, and to know that God is over us. It's God's Word that accomplishes and bears fruit in our lives. But notice there's no shortcuts here. There's no quick fixes. There's no quick prophetic revival and and it's over. It's just the repeated, powerful Word of God. Regularly, consistently, and the patience of God's people to submit to it as God's Word works continually submitting themselves to the truth of what they've heard. God's Word works as God's people submit to it. That's what the Apostle Paul told the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, that God's work was at work in you believers. It's at work among you. Now we are tempted often to quickly turn inward and to get counsel from our feelings and respond to them. That's what Israel did. They responded to their fears. They responded to their comforts. Or we can be quick also to turn outward to to friends, to books, to techniques, to Google. But less often will we find ourselves pausing and just sitting under God's Word with patience. Holding fast to God's Word with patience. Are you patient with the Word of God in your life? Submitting yourself to it with questions, with insecurities, of course, with fears, with doubts, of course. But submitting yourself to the Word of God, trusting the God who is over you. Do you gather eagerly to hear it preached and then pause to submit to the Word that you have heard? Are you patient with the work of God's Word in your church and among people around you? Is what you expect and pray for in your church true growth by the Word of God? Or do you demand quicker things? Do you take up tools of impatience like complaining or grumbling or even distance and apathy? Division among God's people invariably comes from impatience with God's Word. The reason we have such a spectrum of pragmatism and programs and pep talks among the churches of Christ is simply at the end of the day because Christians are impatient with the work of submitting to God's Word. We want something faster. Are we patient with God's Word in in our relationships that we're responsible for? Do people hear from you the Word of God? Or do they hear anecdotes and quick statements and rash judgments? What about in your home if you are married and have children? Is it the Word of God that, that reigns in your household? 
Or do you find yourself, as it's so easy to do in our culture, frantically caught up and running from activity to entertainment to distraction, rather than letting the Word and having time for the Word to reign while you patiently pray that God's Word would work in your life, in your marriage, in your children. Do not underestimate the Word of God. It works. God's Word works. God broke the impasse by the submission of his, to His Word by His people. The third fruit of patience we want to see in verses 3 through 5 is God's people waiting on God. They're waiting on God. Once they followed God's Word, look what happens in verse 3. Who shows up? <laughs> the government. Hostility is normal, remember? It's normal. That's what Ezra's been pains to tell us. This is normal. And as soon as they start to return to faithfulness, it gets hard again. Now this cohort here may seem a little more impartial and judicious, but don't mistake the severity of this. These associates here, and we could even translate that phrase associates in verse 3 as inspectors. These are government inspectors. This would have been intimidating. The Persian kings had a network of informers to cover their vast empire. These informers were usually referred to casually as the eyes of the king. The eyes of the king. So this inquisition by Tatanai and Shethar Bozani is going right to the top. It's going back to the emperor. And they come and show up in verse 4. They ask for, creden- they ask for excuse me, verse 3, they ask for credentials. Who gave you the decree? Let me, let me see your paperwork. Did you pull a permit for this temple? How do we know? And then in verse 4, they ask a question that if you would have been standing there, would have sent shivers down your spine. What are the names of the men who are doing this? This is a government list. They want to put you down on a list going to the empire. That's serious. That's haunting. There's no hiding in anonymity. And you can imagine the fears multiplying in their minds. How long till they come for me? I'm on the list. They know where I live. They know where my family is. So we have here in verse 4 the same choice Israel had at the end of chapter 4. Things are hard again and they're hard quickly. Will they fear God or will they fear the consequences? Will they trust and follow God or seek to cover themselves? Now this inquiry, the letter that we see and and as we'll go into chapter 6, Lord willing, next week, it would have taken months to resolve. How was Israel going to spend these months? Would they spend it in obsessive, impatient fear? You see what happened? Now they're sending a letter to the king. They have our names on it. They have our addresses in it. The eyes of the king are are everywhere. Or were they going to spend these months listening again to the word of God from from Haggai and Zechariah? Remember who are with them, who are supporting them, and going ahead with the work. Patiently, just waiting on God. And that's what they do. Verse 5, notice the eye of their God was on the elders. You see what Ezra's doing there? He's taking the phrase that the Persians used to talk about informers, the eyes of the king, and said that there is an eye on God's people that's vastly more significant than the government inspectors. It's the eye of their God. God was watching. God knew. And God was acting as they trusted him. So they, they weren't stopped. They weren't hindered. It didn't cease until they got a report back. We're not told why, but just that God did it. And God kept the government inspectors from cracking down on their work. They're waiting on God. And God is watching over them as they wait for Him. In 1521, Martin Luther's call to reform the church came to a head at an imperial, it's supposed to be pronounced Diet, it's German. We usually call it the Diet of Worms, which sounds like a really bad way to lose weight for the summer. (laughs) It's actually the Diet of Worms, and it's German. But Diet of Worms is what it looks like. Anyway, Luther was called to this diet. And on April 17th, Martin Luther stood before the empire of the, the emperor of the entire Holy Roman Empire. And he had an impressive round of international powerful men responsible for many armies in the room. He was there to give an account for his writings. Luther knew what was at stake. And they asked him there on April 17th, were these his books? Yes, they were. Will you recant of them? And then Luther did something that was shocking and surprising. He asked for more time, which is kind of weird. I mean, 
They knew, he knew what they were going to ask him. But they gave him a day and consented. Luther returned then the next day, April 18th, and answered, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. God help me, here I stand. Amen. At that point, the entire assembly erupted into chaos. The representatives from Spain were literally shouting that they wanted him burned at the stake right then, right there in the courtyard. Have you ever been in a room where someone is shouting for you to be burned alive? Imagine that. They're shouting for that. Entire chaos goes on. Luther is able to slip out. And actually, the diet wraps up kind of chaotically because a, what essentially an ancient terrorist group had made themselves known in the town unrelated to Luther, and so the emperor has to get out of Worms before things can be wrapped up officially. And then Frederick the Elector, sort of Luther's representative, fakes a kidnapping of him and spirits him away to the Wartburg Castle where Luther can be hid and no one knows he is there and he survives to live and write and minister for more decades. The eye of God was on him. The question is, what was Luther doing that night? He asked for time to answer. <laughs> we don't know. My guess he was putting his trust again in God. He was waiting on God and committing himself to patiently wait and trust God, to go with his word, to follow after him, and to trust that God's eye was on him, whatever the consequences. Luther was remembering the promise that God gave to his people in exile, that those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. That's Isaiah 40. What we need most in our lives beloved, is not more tricks, not more techniques to get over what we're in. What we need is to know the character and sovereignty and attributes of our great God and to wait for him and to know he has always, will always, and can do nothing but, but be consistent with the character of the God who's revealed himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not abandoned or overlooked any of his people ever yet. And he's not starting that with you. We can trust him. We can patiently rely on him. And whatever eyes are upon us, even the eyes of the king, we always know there's a greater eye watching his people. God's people were patiently waiting on God. Fourthly and finally, the last act of patience we want to see in the midst of this letter is they were walking with God. That's what happens when you turn from selfishness. You submit to God's word and you wait for God. What do you become? You become godly. You become someone who knows God. You become someone who's away from your enemies. You become someone who walks with God. And that's really what we have here in this letter. We have the growth of godliness in his people. Like a good historian, what Ezra is doing is including this letter, giving us firsthand material so that we might see the vividness and the reality of what's going on, the historicity. But what we, say and what we get out of that, the wonderful fruit we get from verses 11 to 16 is the reply of the Israelites to Tatanai. And what we see here is the fruit of the exile, the fruit of their suffering being born as they walk with God. As they face an empire that seems so much stronger, what will they say? What do they know? Well, first, they know, verse 11, that God is sovereign. We are servants of the God of heaven and earth. Now, in their culture, in the ancient Near East, if your nation lost to another nation, it would have been assumed that that was because your God was weaker than the other nation's gods. And notice, that kind of bad theology is nowhere in this answer. We, the losers, we, the exiles, the slaves of Persia, we serve the God of heaven and earth. Our God's eyes upon us and over us. We are his subjects first before we're the subjects of anyone else. They knew God's sovereignty. Secondly, notice in verse 12, they knew God's judgment and discipline of them as sinners. They knew themselves as sinners. The exile and even the position they find themselves in now, why is that? <laughs> it's because they angered the God of heaven, verse 12. And he gave us over into the hand of king of Babylon. And they carried away this temple. 
It's not because Babylon was wiser, not because Persia was better, and it certainly wasn't because their God was impotent. In no way is their position and their defeat in any way reflect upon the power of God. In fact, it shows it. It was his discipline. God was in complete control the whole time, and that included any king listening. Think about who's getting this letter, Darius. And they are making clear on no uncertain terms, the great kings and emperors of this world, they are pawns in the hands of our God, doing what he's determined in his plan, even disciplining us. And more, not just God, themselves as sinners, they know, thirdly, God's steadfast love. What they sang about in chapter 3. Notice as he recounts from verse 13 to verse 14, 15, all the vessels being brought back up. All these vessels that were released by Cyrus that had been carried away by Nebuchadnezzar. They're all brought back. God's steadfast love. He hadn't even lost the instruments of his own temple. The whole time God is keeping them. And then they know God's promises. End of verse 16. I really, as I was reflecting on this, came to love their answer. (laughs) Why are you rebuilding? Who gave you this decree? (laughs) We've been building it until now. And it's not done yet. That's why we're building. It's so matter of fact and so full of faith. Why are you building? Well, God told us to and it's not done. What do you want us to do? God has preserved us. God has brought us back. God has charged us through the king that we're to build this temple and it's not done. Notice you have in this answer wonderfully in verse 16, a holy indifference to the inquiry of the government and the bureaucrats there inspecting them, an indifference to the ragings of the people around them, an indifference to the the lawsuits coming. God commanded us to do it, so we're going to finish it. You see, God's sovereign power, the reality of their sin and God's discipline, God's steadfast love and their, their confidence in God's promises is all overflowing in their answer. This, beloved, is the answer of men who've come to walk with God and patiently trust Him. And the reality of it, it just pervades even how they answer. Do you notice they're not angry? They don't answer in rage. Do they have reason to be angry? I'm angry. I was angry reading it. (laughs) They're only doing what Cyrus decreed. They were told by the government to do this. They got permission. And they've been harassed by the people And they got now some jackboot Nazi that wants my papers? Give me a break. I wanted to ring up a yellow flag with a snake on it saying, don't tread on me and start marching around. This is crazy. Government imposition, bureaucratic inefficiency. It's terrible. And they're not angry. They're not angry at all. They trust God. These men answer as though they're looking to another world. They're looking to the God over them, not a world of kings and decrees and political expedience, but of their God, knowing their sin, the consequences of it, and knowing their necessary obedience now. I suggest to you that what we have here, the grace among God's people, is reflecting just a little bit what will be brightly shown in the holy perfection of God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord Jesus was pulled before Pilate in John chapter 18, his answer was, my kingdom is not of this world. And if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. That's why we're not fighting. And when he was abused and mistreated and slandered and spit upon with a crown of thorns, and when Pilate threatened him with his authority, don't you know what I could do to you? And Jesus responded to him in John 19, you have no authority over anyone except what's been given to you. I trust my Father who gave you the authority you have and know the authority you exercise is only what he allows you to do. As the Lord Jesus was willingly laying down his life for our sins. Our Lord Christ walked with God perfectly and he knew whatever he faced, even government oppression, was the will of his Father and he could trust himself to him who judges justly. This full knowledge of God is given to all who trust in Christ. We saw it even in Jesus' first disciples. We see it in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 5, when Peter and John are hauled in and told, I thought we told you to stop preaching the gospel. And what did they answer? We must obey God, not men. 
pretty similar to this answer, I think, in Ezra 5.16. Christ is building his church. It ain't done yet is why we're preaching the gospel. And it doesn't matter who you are or why you are. We are going to continue. Those who walk with God don't need to fear men any longer. This is in line with the rules that Martin Luther gave reflecting on his life on how one knows God and becomes a true theologian. He said there are three rules to becoming a true theologian. You must pray, of course. You must meditate on God's word. And thirdly, the third rule Luther gives is surprising. It's not read theology textbooks. You have to suffer. This is what Luther said. I myself owe my opponents many thanks for so beating, pressing, and frightening me through the devil's raging They've turned me into a pretty good theologian. They've driven me to a goal I never would have reached. You have to pray. You have to study God's word. And you have to suffer. And there are no shortcuts. I hope all of us want to know God. I hope that's why you're here. That you want to have peace with him. The peace he gives in every situation. And if we do, then we need to know that we cannot find that in a textbook. That knowing God is far more than just having truths about God in the right order in our minds. And don't get me wrong, we need to do that too. But it's far more than that. We have to walk with God in suffering, in hardship and opposition. Walking with God means turning from ourselves, submitting to His Word, waiting on His timing. It means patience. It means trusting Him and suffering even while we trust Him as we get to know Him more. And we walk with him and he removes our fears and he removes our infidelity. I've been told that I should never pray for patience because the Lord will give it to me. I tell you, beloved, you had better pray for patience because you will have nothing else, including God, without it. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for these things written for our instruction, for our exhortation, and for our courage. We rejoice to know that you who was over your people thousands of years ago is over us today. Your eye is upon us, and we might trust you. Father, we help us to grow, help us to trust you, and we pray that all of us, everyone here, would become a real and true theologian who knows you. And that as you worked in the dealings of your people in Israel, as you have worked down through history, as you've worked even in the lives around us today, we pray you would continue to work in our lives. Root out, Father, the impatience and all the evidences of it in our lives. Help us to hold fast to your word in submission and trust and even quietness at times, and help us when we give an answer for the hope within us to be men and women looking to you and not to our own devices. Father, we pray, continue to build your church and find us faithfully and diligently at work until you are done. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.